Good morning, and welcome to Freedom Church this morning. So, we look a little different than usual today, but we've got people here and there and vacationing and whatever. So, we've got people that are willing to step up and fill in to help us to uh, lead worship together. And so, with that being said, let's stand and sing together. Good morning. 
Welcome to Freedom Church. I'm so glad we're here today. I'm so glad you're here today as well. And we can worship together in spirit and in truth in this place. Uh, yesterday we celebrated the 20th anniversary of uh, the uh, terrorist attack in our country. And uh, I've been thinking over the course of the last several days uh, about that in detail. Uh, I remember very vividly my uh, secretary coming into my office about five minutes after nine uh, on that uh, particular day. And she said that uh, a plane had flown into the World Trade Center. Now, I'd seen the World Trade Centers uh, every day when I was in the military. We were about 40 miles from New York City, and I could look toward the, uh, the skyline to the uh, south and west of where I was stationed and uh, could always see uh, the Empire State Building and the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And um, I, I remember going home that morning and watching the television coverage and spending the day uh, there in my den doing that. And um, it was a day of, of reckoning, I suspect, for us. Uh, I think that we had... Uh, grown to become, as a nation, grown somewhat to become like uh, teenagers. You remember when we were teenagers, we thought we were invincible. And I think our nation came to that place where she thought she was invincible as well. And that uh, served as a wake-up call for us. Interestingly enough, that, um, that all of those events of that day prompted... Uh, people to go back to church but having said that you need to understand that that it was only for about six weeks that people were back and involved with church and then it was situation back to normal very quickly and so um, in the midst of tragedy uh, we recognize the need for our Heavenly Father. And in the midst of these days, with the Delta variant and COVID continuing to run rampant through our world, we recognize the need for our Heavenly Father as well. The Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, that the God of all grace has called us to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. And he himself will perfect us. He himself will confirm us. He himself will strengthen us. And he will establish you and me. And so to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith in the midst of these days. For those of you who have not heard, let me remind you and just let you know that um, Josh Taylor lost his battle with COVID yesterday. Aaron made the decision to take him off the ventilator and off the ECMO machine as well. And um, he, he gave up life on this planet. And so COVID defeated him. But no, that's not the case. Because he's now in the presence of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we can rejoice with Josh today knowing that he's in God's presence I would ask that in these days Josh and Aaron have a special place in my heart and I shared this last Sunday because they were the first missionaries that, uh, that I dealt with from uh, Baptist Bible Fellowship when I came here and so I have a soft spot in my heart for them and so I would ask that you would pray for Aaron in these days, Josh's dear wife, and for Caleb, Rebecca, and Micah, their children in the midst of these days as well as they're dealing with the grief of losing a father.
but also dealing with the hope of knowing they will see him again. So this morning, before we pray together as the family of God here in this place, are there those on your heart today that you would like to share with us? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Something else. Well, let's pray together this morning. Father, in the quietness and the stillness of this moment, we acknowledge that you're King of kings and Lord of lords and that you love us. Lord, we exalt your name above every name over all the earth. We recognize that you are sovereign over this world as well. And Father, for these who have been mentioned today, our loss is heaven's gain. And Father, that does not eliminate the grief that we experience when we lose someone close to us. And someone who has been with us here on planet Earth. And so, Father, we pray that you would surround us with your body, the church, and that we might feel your presence in a profound way in the midst of these days. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified. We pray that our expression of worship today might bring honor and glory unto you and unto your kingdom's work here in this place. Father, I thank you for those who are here today. I know that there are a number of our family who are not here. They're out of town and doing other things today. We would pray for them. Pray that you would visit us in the context of this experience of worship today. Lead us into your very presence this morning, Heavenly Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a couple more songs, so join us and stand together.
heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord let us be the life that we breathe. He is the reason why we wake up in the morning and the reason why we make it through each day. So let's sing our hearts out to him in praise this morning. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark.
Dear Heavenly Father, we that you would fill our hearts with your praise every moment of the day. Father God, we ask now that you be with Jay and help him to proclaim your word to the best of his ability. Just shine through him, Lord, through the word of the Holy Bible that we have to instruct us. Father God, we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be seated. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. And we're going to look today, beginning to look anyway, at the third of the five servant songs found in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, we saw the calling and the commissioning of of the servant, first servant song. Second servant song found in Isaiah chapter 49 served as an indication to us of what the mission of the servant was going to be. And so now as we move into this third servant song, what we discover in Isaac, excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 50 is the training of the servant. Now, not only are we seeing the training that Almighty God gave His Son, our Savior, as He functioned as the servant in Isaiah, but also we recognize, based upon what Isaiah declares to us in this passage, that we too are servants of the Lord. And as such, we need to be trained, we need to be taught as well. So I remind you, the third servant song, and it emphasizes five characteristics, if you will, of a servant of the Lord, a true servant of the Lord. So in verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 50, we find that the servant has a heart of gentleness. A heart of gentleness, a heart of sincerity, and a heart of compassion. And quite frankly, what you and I know is that if we're going to make a difference in our community, then those three things are going to be necessary for us as well. That we function with a heart of gentleness. That there is a sensitivity to the needs of people round about us that causes us to see where they are and see their need for a Savior. And just like Christ, we have been called to be compassionate. So verse 4, although those words are not found in that verse, that is the essence of what 
Isaiah is declaring to us there in verse 4. Then in verse 5, we see that it is necessary for the servant to have a trained tongue. When we talk about a trained tongue, we talk about the need for being able to proclaim what God has called us to proclaim. So we begin to recognize that um, within the context of the fallen nature, our tongue has not been trained. And when we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, it is imperative that the things that come out of our mouths, coming from our heart, that they are things that are edifying, that they are things that make a difference in the lives of individuals, and that they are things that we have been taught by God to share from His Holy Word with mankind. So in chapter 4 we see this heart of gentleness. In, cha- in verse 5 we see a trained tongue. In verses 4 and 5 we also recognize the need for a hearing ear. When the Word of God speaks of this idea of hearing, it's thinking more in terms of not just those impulses of sound that move into your ears and rattle those three little bones that are located in each of your ear canals, but that we are taking what we have processed with our hearing apparatus and we're contemplating that. We are listening to it. We're rehearing it, if you will. We are using it to make a difference in our lives. And so it's more than just hearing. It is hearing with our hearts. Hearing with our heads hearing with a sense that what we are hearing is making a difference in our lives. So verses 4 and 5 talk to us about having a hearing ear. Then in verse 6, we recognize the need for sacrificial love. Now you and I would recognize that Christ gave his life as a sacrifice for mankind, correct? We would understand that he shed his precious blood so that through that blood we might be able to become members of the family of God. So we have the example of Christ as being the sacrificial lamb that was slain for the sin of the entire world. And then as we look at his example, we begin to understand that not only do we see and recognize his example, but that our lives then are to be an example of sacrificial love within the context of the world in which we live. So if we're going to make a difference, you remember that John 3 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, Christ, should not perish but have everlasting life. And that you and I also must come to the realization that if we are going to make inroads into our world, if we are going to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, if Freedom Church is going to make a difference in Campbellsville and or Taylor County, it is going to be because we have chosen as the people of God here in this place to operate with sacrificial 
love. That the giving of ourselves is that which is going to make a difference in the lives of those we come in contact with. And then the fifth thing that we see in this list of characteristics found in this passage is found in verses 7 through 9. And the Bible speaks to us about the servant of God. Within the context of this servant song, sets his or her face like flint that we are consumed with the issue of doing what needs to be done the word of god tells us in the new testament that jesus as he was leaving galilee on that trek to jerusalem and that passion week that was to follow, and his death that was ultimately going to take place at the end of that Passion Week, that the Bible declares to us that he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. And in essence, what that means to us is that not only did Christ, recognizing that that was the the role that God had for him to participate in as it relates to the salvation of mankind, that thing which God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit decided before the world was even spoken into existence that there would be a plan of salvation available to mankind. So we see him determining within his own life and heart that he was going to Jerusalem to fulfill that which God had for him. And so we, here at Freedom Church, must begin to make that determination about what it is that God has for us as the people of God here in this place. And that we then determine that it is God's absolute and perfect will that we are going to do. And we then set our faces like flint to do the will of God with nothing, no thing getting in our way and keeping us from being what God intends us to be here in this place. So in the same way that Christ set himself to go to Jerusalem, knowing the fate that awaited him there, there is a will of God for us. And a will that God expects us to fulfill within the context of his kingdom's work. And so the outline for uh, chapter 50 verses 4 through 11 follows. Verse 4 talks about a readiness to learn. And so we see that in the life of the servant, Jesus And we also understand that there needs to be a readiness to learn in your life and in mine. Number two, you see that on the screen behind me. Uh, We must, Christ must resolve to suffer. And so in verses 5 and 6, we see his resolution, his resolvingness to suffer for the kingdom's sake. The third primary section is a vindication of the servant. So in verses 7 through 9, Jesus, the servant, is vindicated for those things that took place in his life. Then in verse 10, we recognize that there is a picture of trusting found in that verse 10. And then in verse 11, we see a picture of seeing 
the outcome, understanding the end. And because of the understanding of the end, it propelled and brought him to that very place. So let me read to you this morning out of uh, Isaiah chapter 50, beginning in verse 4 and reading through verse 11. I would ask you as you look at this passage and as you hear it, as I read it, notice the number of times that we see the term Lord God or the number of times we see God being mentioned or the Lord being mentioned as well. Typically, if your Bible, if the translation of Scripture you have capitalizes those who are uh, deity, if he capitalizes deity, you will see within the context of this passage that typically the me or mine in this passage is capitalized as well, speaking of the servant, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. So look what it says, beginning in verse 4. The Lord God has given me, notice the me's in capital, Jesus, the tongue of the learned, that I, Christ, should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He, God, awakens me, Jesus, morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Verse 5, the Lord God has opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, Jesus says, and my cheek to those who plucked out the beard. Now remember, we're talking about the book of Isaiah here. We're talking about a book that was written approximately 750 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I, even with the limited knowledge that we have of the New Testament, are able to see the prophetic significance of what's being said here in Isaiah chapter 50. Because we know that they pulled Christ's beard off of his face. And we know that they beat him on his back. And in fact, Isaiah chapter 53 declares to us, and we'll get to that at some point, Isaiah 53 declares to us that his visage was marred more than any other man. That is to say, in the vernacular of our day, that he was beaten so severely, he no longer looked like a human being. And he endured that for your sake and for mine. And he endured that for the sin of all mankind. And so potentially what we have through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Oh, by the way, the book of Hebrews says that it was a once and for all sacrifice. No longer would there be a need on Tishri 10 for the high priest to go into the most holy place. But that, that atoning sacrifice for sin... Jesus presented in heaven to his Father. And then he sat down at the right hand of God the Father, symbolizing for us that he had finished the work that his Father sent him to do. And so we see here that they plucked out his beard. And then he says, I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Verse 7 for the Lord God will help me, Jesus says. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. 
And yet, even in the midst of the Roman soldiers and the emissaries from the Sanhedrin who came to Jesus and disgraced him, that what's being said here in Isaiah chapter 50 is that his disgrace was not everlasting. That even though he was disgraced by being hung naked on a cross, which was the manner in which the Romans did that, to make that event that much more disgraceful. And so we know that Christ took that disgrace upon himself. But we also know that it was short-lived in the sense that uh, on the third day in the power of the Holy Spirit, he was resurrected from the grave. That the Bible says we have 14 different times given us in the New Testament whereby our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to uh, individuals and groups after his resurrection. And so his disgrace was short lived so look what it says so therefore I will not be disgraced therefore I have set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed he who is near justifies me Jesus is declaring he who is near is almighty God and it is he that justifies him and oh by the way It is He, God, who justifies Freedom Church. It is He, God, who justifies you and me. And as we begin to understand that, and we begin to see it in action in our lives, we recognize that it is a work that only God can do. Look what he says. Verse 8, he who is near justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Do you remember that story in Matthew chapter 4? where Jesus, after his baptism, was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And after 40 days of fasting, the Bible says that he hungered. And it was then, at the moment of crisis, if you will, that the enemy came to him and sought to have him do not only what Eve did as it relates to declaring that God said something he did not say, but that the enemy sought to have him receive glory and honor and power through means that were not God's way. And so... You remember in that great trial of Christ that he used Scripture to keep the enemy at bay. And the Bible says at the end of that passage that the enemy left him for a season And then the Bible tells us that the angels came and ministered to him in that time. And so we see here in this passage that the adversary did come, but we know also that what Christ did was destroy the adversary's primary weapon which was death. The Bible also tells us that Christ is the first fruits of them who have died. That is to say, God resurrected him from the grave. 
and that we who know Christ will be resurrected as well. And so when someone who knows Christ dies, yes, there's still grief. Yes, it leaves a hole in our heart. Yes, it is difficult to deal with. But because that person knows Christ, we have the assurance of the Word of God that we will see them again. And there is this hope, this eschatological hope, this end-time hope, if you will, that we recognize that there's a day coming and we will be with them and with Jesus for all eternity. So Christ declares, let my adversary come near to me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he? Who is he who will condemn me. Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment, and the moth will eat them up. Talking about those who are outside the family of God, those who seek to be adversarial against the Christ. Who among you fears the Lord, verse 10 says? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness? and has no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourself with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. So look with me just for a time this morning at verse 4. Notice what it says. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary And so, just as Christ recognized in the context of the prophecy of Isaiah that he had an obligation and a responsibility to speak to the weary, so too we, who are servants of God, have an obligation and a responsibility to speak to those who are weary. And that you and I would understand that just as Christ had compassion for those who were lost, just as He had compassion on us who once were lost, but are now found. We're once blind, but now we see. That we understand that just as Christ was compassionate, so too we, who are the body of Christ in this place, who are the people of God, who have been planted in this place physically, for a specific reason, at a specific moment in time, so that God can be glorified through Freedom Church, that we have an obligation and a responsibility to be compassionate to those who are lost. So Jesus declared in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, This is what he says, listen to this. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I, Jesus says, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light, for I am gentle 
and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Wow. Wow. Think about that just for a minute. Christ has called us to become learners under Him. The declaration that He made in Matthew chapter 28, that we're to make disciples of all nations, that we are to be followers of Christ, disciples. The Greek word for disciple is mathetes. And that we see ourselves as followers of Jesus. And we look at His example within the context of the New Testament. So that we see just how He set His face like flint to go to Jerusalem. And then we see how our faces must be set to go into Campbellsville and go into Taylor County to make a difference and to tell people about the Jesus that we know. And so those three words that we used to describe how Christ dealt with the one who is weary and the three words that describe the body of Christ as they deal with weary people are gentleness number one and so we live in a chaotic world do we not do we not recognize that our 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 world is topsy-turvy is upside down that things change not just from day to day but minute to minute and even second to second and that the world treats people roughly, does it not? We know that. I mean, we live in a world, we live in this world, and we recognize that the world has little or no regard for us, or for anyone else for that matter. And that's because the world system that is in the, in the world today is contrary to the will of God. And it is a system that seeks to destroy God and God's will as well. And so you and I, just as Christ did, brought this gentleness to the table. We too, as the people of God, must bring the gentleness of Jesus to a world that is lost, to a world that is out of control. And you see what happens? When we begin to do that, the world begins to see that, hey, there's something different about those people who claim to be followers of Christ. They function in an entirely different manner than the people of the world. And so, just as Peter says about us in 1 Peter chapter 2, there's a distinction between us and the world. There's a difference between the church and the world. There's a difference between us and people who are lost. And that distinction should be so Evident, just as it was evident in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the context of the world in which He lived when He was here in His incarnation, that we understand that He was different from the world and we too must exemplify that difference to those we come in contact with as well. So there was a courtesy that Jesus operated in. There was a politeness that Jesus operated in. And so when we look at the way Jesus dealt with lost people, he was straight to the point, was he not? But he was polite in how he did that. 
and that we too need to put on this mantle of gentleness whereby through that mantle of gentleness the world is able to see something different in us. He also carried with him a sensitivity and an, which is an ability to feel or perceive. And so if we're going to make a difference in our world, we need to be sensitive to the needs of people. Because what God's going to do is He's going to use those needs as signposts. He is going to use those needs as directional arrows to move us along that continuum whereby we're making a difference in the lives of individuals. That's why it's so important for us to understand our community. That's why it's so important for us to recognize who lives here in Campbellsville and Taylor County. That's why it's so important for us to see what's going on round about us. Because the ministry in Campbellsville is going to be significantly different than a ministry in Elizabethtown, a ministry in Lebanon Junction, a ministry in Louisville, because each of those geographic locations has different needs. And so as we understand the needs here, these needs, because of our sensitivity to those needs, begin to move us in a particular direction, ministering to them. Look, look at what we've done here. Just because there were needs, we have begun to do ministry to people that had we not had dinners for them, we would have never come to know them. Or it would have been much more difficult for us to come to know those people. But God put us in a position where a, a, a need was made a, available to us. We responded to that need, and we began a relationship with that group of people. And you see, that's how evangelism is done. That's how ministry takes place. And that as we do that, God begins to put more of those things in our, our way, in our arena of service. And we begin to do more of those things. And that group continues to grow and become greater. And we begin to do more ministry and see people's lives changed. And then third, compassion. And compassion could be defined as sympathy or mercy. So not only are we to be sensitive to the needs of people, we need to have compassion on them as well. Now, think about that for a moment. You and I, who know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, We've been blood-bought, we're born again, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new, and so we're different now than we used to be. But there was a time before we knew Christ as our personal Lord and Savior when we operated according to the course of the world, right? And that because we have been redeemed, we now are able to have compassion on those who are blinded by the deceit and the lies of the enemy. And we recognize full well that those individuals 
need to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And so we're sympathetic to their plight. We're sympathetic to where they are. But in the context of our sympathy, we recognize that that's not the place for them to stay. That they need to move through that place to a better place, to a new place, to a transformational place, so that God can be glorified in their lives as well. So we recognize and we're sympathetic with and we know and understand it is only by God's grace, right? Nothing you and I did, everything that God did to bring us to the place of salvation. And then what we understand is that our lives now are made up of the gift of mercy from God in our lives. And so we then become, now look how this works. We come to know Christ. We, we then become a channel of blessing. Remember that song? Is your life a channel of blessing? Is the love of God flowing through you? Well, and the chorus of that says, make me a channel of blessing. So what we, what we understand then is that as we become that channel of blessings, we recognize that God has made us also a vessel of His mercy. And that being a vessel of mercy, it then moves people to understand better the need for grace in their lives and then the grace that is available through Christ for them as well. So we see here in this passage and in verse 4 that the Lord God, the sovereign one of the universe, had given Jesus the tongue of the learned. Now, Matthew tells us, no, excuse me, Luke tells us that Jesus, in Luke chapter 2, that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature with both God and men. So if it was necessary for the Divine One, the incarnate Christ, to grow and become a learner and have the tongue of the learned, how much more so then is it for us to be taught by God in this world. Now why was Jesus taught? The same reason that you and I should be taught. That I should know how to speak a word in season to one who is weary. You remember what, remember what God did to Abram over in Genesis chapter 12? You remember that story that God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees? And he said, Abram, I want you to go to a place, I want you to gather your family together, and then I want you to go to a place I'll tell you about when you get there. And Abram, who according to Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses, that God declared that he would become a great nation. And we know that the Jews came out of Abraham, who before he became Abraham was called Abram. And so we have this picture in Genesis of God taking this one and utilizing the faith of this one to bring him to a place 
where he might so glorify God that out of him would come something new. And I believe that God wants to use in your life and in mine, in the life of this church, a people who are of great faith and who, because of their great faith, are willing to do what needs to be done so that God can be glorified through this place in the same manner, in the same, maybe not the same measure, but in the same certain kind of way that God blessed Abraham to be the father of, of the Jews. And so in this day, what God has called us to do is just as important as that which God called Abram to do in Genesis chapter 12. The question is, and the question becomes, and I suspect that maybe the question always will be, are we willing to walk by faith now remember that without faith, Hebrews tells us, it's impossible to please God. So if you and I are not living by faith, we're living by unbelief. And if we're living by unbelief, we're functioning contrary to the will and the way of Almighty God. Wrong. We're moving in, in the wrong direction. So he's called us to be a people of faith. Now here's what we know about being a people of faith. That, that when we begin to operate in faith and by faith, that um, we begin to strengthen each other because the atmosphere, and we, and we sang about this, this atmosphere that the Holy Spirit functions in, that, that when the atmosphere of, of faith begins to manifest itself, then the potential for greater faith within the context of the body becomes something we can do and becomes something that we should do as the people of God. So as we begin to move forward in faith, now I, I, I define faith for you, Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is the substance. So that means it's tangible. It is a fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, so when we begin to operate in faith, now faith is the substance, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So faith is substance and it's evidence. So how are we going to get more faith? If it is one of the fruit of the Spirit of God, and, and there are nine fruits of the Spirit, then what that means to us is that we need to surrender ourselves more to God's Holy Spirit. Because when we, can, when we surrender ourselves to God's Holy Spirit, you remember what Jesus said, that he sent another comforter to live, amongst us, to live in us, not just amongst us, so that he would point us to Jesus. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine is to point us and others to Jesus. So God wants to use us, filled with faith, to point others to Jesus. But if we're not submitted to God's Holy Spirit, we will never be able to do what we might do if we were completely submitted to Him in the power of the Spirit. So the question I have for us today, and the place where we've got to go, is... How would you assess your faith today? So if you're going to gauge your faith, 
on a scale of 1 to 10 this morning. 1 being very little faith, and 10 being great faith. Why is your faith at the, at the level that it's at? And what's hindering you from having great faith in the midst of the world in which we live? Because it's going to be those who have great faith and those groups of believers who have great faith that are going to make a difference in this community. It's not just those that have great crowds. It's going to be those who have great faith. So my question to us this morning, all of us, is that if we're followers of Christ and we already know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, what's hindering us from being people of great faith? Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you this morning. We thank you for your blessed holy word. We recognize that you have spoken to us today in the power of of the book of Isaiah chapter 50 and that there are a multiplicity father of uh, truths to be found in this passage Lord I pray today that in the power of your dear Holy Spirit and we invite him to dwell in this place with us father I pray that he would dwell over each of us this morning and that he would seek to do that work of eradication in our lives of anything that does not look like Jesus in my life or in the life of anyone here today. Father, help us to see. Help us to know. Help us to become vibrantly active children here in this place this morning. Father, move on your people today. Engage us. Energize us. Minister to us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? Let me just let me define two words in that worship and obey. Now we know what it means to obey, and we know what's happened. We know what happens to us when we don't obey. Well, our obedience as followers of Christ come, comes out of our worship. And worship is no more or no less than being in the presence of God. 
Just like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Because when you read that passage, what you discover is that when Isaiah was in the presence of God, God's presence changed him. And so then obedience, obedience is a direct result of worship. So if we're going to be obedient to God, we've got to worship. Because if we don't worship and try to walk in obedience, then that obedience is going to be less than what it should have been. And that obedience is going to be false because worship changes us and causes us to be obedient. So if you're trying to be obedient, just honestly, if you're trying to be obedient today, in the power of your flesh, in this carton, it ain't going to work. It's never going to work. We can only be obedient when we've worshipped. Period. In the sentence, in the paragraph, in the page, in the document. That's it. Worship and obedience go together. They cannot be separated. We see that in, in Christ. Look what Jesus did. When Jesus was preparing to, to call his disciples, you know what the Word of God says? He spent 24 hours in prayer with his Father before he made that decision. That's what the Bible tells us. He prayed all night to make sure he was where he needed to be so that he could uh, call those who needed to be called to be a part of that. So he needed to be with his father. Lord knows we do, right? And if we're going to be obedient to the word of God and the will of God and the way of God, it's only going to happen because we've worshipped God and that worship changed us and caused us to be obedient. So you think about those two words, worship and obey. Worship and obedience. They're sister terms. They cannot be separated. Be seated this morning, just for a minute. We have birthdays. Kenan Shively and Brother David. Well, let's let's sing happy birthday to them. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday. I wondered who was going to start us since Chad wasn't here to do that, but I appreciate us getting, <laughs> getting to that place. <coughs> Announcements this morning. Let me just remind you that there are baskets on the back table behind you in front of me, that if you have offering, you can put that in there today. Let me encourage you to be praying for us as a body. Obviously, you're praying for yourself in that context. That... Um, that as we move forward, we move forward in faith. And that we worship God so that we can be a people who obey appropriately and do the things that God has called us to do here in this place. Is there a word from someone this morning before we go? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Sherrod. Appreciate that. We're certainly uh, glad that it, that it turned out that way. Amen. God's so good. Something else this morning. Brian, would you close us in a word of prayer? Please, my brother.